you don't have a videotape memory and it isn't obvious that the memories that you have of traumatic events are fully fledged and causally appropriate but just not paid attention to it's more like they're murky and unclear in and of themselves and they contain too much and I don't think that people so much repress as they do f refuse to attend to or are unable to attend to so it's more like a passive avoidance than a passive avoidance of something that needs to be explored and gone through rather than it is something you know that you don't want to look at that you or part of you has put away terrible things have happened to you and you or some part of you doesn't want to to um, to know about them, to know about them, and so they live this, those repressed experiences live an autonomous life of their own too, and you, you, here's an example of, a trivial example of how that might work, imagine that you're at work, and your boss says something to you that disturbs you, maybe it makes you question whether your job is stable, and so you're kind of upset about that, but it's a casual offhand comment, and you go back to work, and you just sort of forget that that even happened, you know, you Maybe because you're attending to something else. But then you go home and you're just crabby as, as can possibly be. And you go home and one of the people there says something a little annoying and you snap at them. It's like, well, that's analogous to what Freud would call a complex, right? Is that this, because you can imagine what's happened is that the boss's words have brought up a whole little sub-personality predicated on doubt up to the surface. And who knows how deep that would be. Well, what happens if I lose my job? And if I lose my job, well, what sort of person am I? Exactly, and what about all these other times that I've failed and, and then maybe you remember the other times that you failed and what am I going to do in the future? And so it's this whole cluster of ideas that surrounds that doubt and that's been activated It's a little part of you and then maybe you're not attending to that because you're busy doing some other work But when you go home something triggers it and it, like it's already there It's already you get way more upset than you should and that's that's what a complex is except in a much more complicated manner like a complex might be a whole series of experiences that you've had that are united by some emotion, like threat, that aren't, haven't been transformed into a coherent representation, but that can rise out of the unconscious and possess you. If you guys, many of you guys have been uh, depressed at at least one point in your life, you know, it's, it's actually very common for University of Toronto students, um, <laughs> especially in their first year. It's about one in three, if you, if you give students the Beck Depression Inventory, about one in three Toro University of Toronto students in our research have, have hit criteria for hospitalization. I mean, the Beck is a little oversensitive as far as I'm concerned, but, but you know what it's like when you're depressed? It's like, it's, it's, it's a part of your personality sort of subsumes the whole, and depression quite classically is, well, you can't think of anything good that happened to you in the past, and you can't think of any reason why the present is good for anything, and you're pretty damn hopeless about the future. And so that's a complex as well, and it's a complex that consists of nothing but negative emotion, and it structures your memory and your perception and your plans for the future all at the same time. Now, Freud had a, a very lengthy list of ways that people could be treacherous towards experiences they had that they wanted to repress and so he called them defense mechanisms this is how you fool yourself into believing that you don't have to take into account a certain set of negative experiences you know it's like well we'll go through them repression okay well we talked about that denial well that often denial is a very complicated one um, see if I can come up with a good example <coughs> Well, there's a classic example for people who have, I think it's called anosognosia, I don't remember exactly. It's neglect. That's a less technical way of thinking about it. So let's say you have a right parietal damage from a stroke, and you'll lose the left side of your body, so you can't move it anymore. But uh, worse, you don't know it's there, and you don't know that the left side of anything is there anymore. And God only knows how that happens. But, like, you'll only eat half the food on your plate, only on the right-hand side. And if someone asks you to draw a clock, you'll cram all the numbers into the one side. And so you kind of lose the idea of left. And I think it's sort of like, you know how... The, when you're looking forward, there's nothing behind you. You can't see anything back here. It's, it's not black. It's not even gone. It's just simply not there at all. And so if you could imagine that sort of stretching around halfway, 
that seems to be something what neglect is like. But anyways, if you, if you take someone with neglect, according to Ramachandran, and if you irrigate their ear with cold water, uh, the, the, the ear on the opposite side, then they'll kind of have a little convulsion, and then all of a sudden they become aware of their missing left side. If you talk to them before you do the irrigation, you say, well, well what's up with your left arm? And they'll say, well, I, I, my arthritis is bothering me, and I don't want to move it. They come up with some something that sounds akin to denial, you know, and then if you can snap them out of that with that irrigation, then they'll have a catastrophic emotional response, logically enough, to the loss of their entire left side, and Ramachandran reports that lasting about 20 minutes, and then they'll snap out of it and go right back into the denial. And sometimes people deny things because they can't update. What's happened to them is so overwhelming that they cannot construct a new model. They just rely on the old one. And you see this, well, imagine first that you've just had a tooth pulled and you know how many, how long your tongue takes to like remap the inside of your mouth. It's really hard to come up with a new concept of you if something catastrophic happens. And so sometimes the denial is just that something, the thing that has happened is so overwhelming that the person can't model it. But then maybe also they refuse to think about it. And you see this emerging in lots of strange ways. So for example, if people develop diabetes, for example, they're often not very good at taking their medication or regulating their diet. And you might say, well, they're denying the existence of their illness. And to some degree, they're probably doing that because who the hell wants to think that they're diabetic? But even worse than that, it's like, it's complicated to be diabetic. You're no longer the same person that you were. And so you have to learn a whole bunch of new ways to be this new person, what to eat, when to eat, how to check your blood. You have to be careful whenever you go out and eat. Like, there's, there's a, a hundred new things a day that you have to learn. And so separating denial from inability is a hard one, but you can also understand that people might deny, no, that's just not happening. That's, that's, I'm not going to admit to that. Reaction formation. Oh, that's one. Maybe you hate your sister, and maybe you have your reasons, but you shouldn't hate your sister. So what you do is act as if you really, really like her. That's an overcompensation. So that's another form of of defense mechanism. Displacement. My boss yells at me, I yell at my husband, my husband yells at the baby, the baby bites the cat. Well, they're not really dealing with the problem, which is the boss. It's just pushed on down the road. And identification. Uh, you're bullied. And instead of coming to terms with the fact that bullying occurs, you start bullying other people. Uh, rationalization. Well, you know what that means already, you know, maybe you don't do your homework, you're procrastinating, I bet you can come up with 15 rationalizations, no problem, for why it's actually not necessary for you to do your homework right then. Intellectualization, well, Woody Allen's movies are about like that, he's got all these neurotic problems, but he's smart, and so he can come up with intelligent reasons why he's so messed up, even though he knows he's messed up and it doesn't help.